person to be able to have time for questioning. The lesson is very clear, and the important thing is to have the grace of God and enough fear of God to do exactly what the Lord has told us to do. Only that we need to understand that the lesson for us as leaders is not only on our own children. It's very important we keep our children under control. Very important that we instruct our children and we discipline our children if our children go wrong. And we discipline them appropriately to the point that they will feel the impact and the pain of the discipline so that they will have change of life. But it also applies to all people that are under our leadership. The man, for example, uh, has not only children under his leadership in the home, he has his wife under his leadership at home. And many times, the understanding or the limitation of Christian doctrine on this area, on marriage, is just love your wife, and that is all. But there should be a way that the husband will show spiritual concern over the wife, that if the wife is going astray, not obeying the Bible, the husband will not continue to smile, appreciate, approve, and just condone and feel that the wife then feeling that everything is okay. When we know that everything is not okay, although you cannot beat your wife, although you cannot, in quote, discipline your wife, but you can pray. And then you can talk to your wife and show her the Bible way and show her that except a person be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And emphasize to her, that if she continues disobeying the word of God, you might be separated forever in eternity. Which means you might go to heaven if you keep your own salvation, and she might go to hell. If we do not tell the truth in that way, and we deny our wives the truth of the fact that without holiness, even our wife will not see the Lord, then we are really doing havoc. And it comes back to Eli and the children. It means that because this is your wife, and all you know is to eat and smile and love and provide, you do not know how to make your wife go the way of the Lord. The same thing with the wife to the husband. You see that your husband is going astray, and your husband is not living right. Once again, you cannot beat your husband, you cannot scold your husband, you cannot, in quote, discipline your husband. But at least you can be sincere enough to raise alarm to leadership in the church and say that, well, I love my husband, I submit to my husband, but I know that my husband is not going the way of righteousness. My husband needs help. My husband needs church involvement in his life so that he will be able to live right and if the church finds out that the husband has done something that is, according to the word of God, sinful or criminal or something that has to be rebuilt, when the church does that, you are going to support the church with your prayer. You are going to be praying that the fire will burn and it will be very painful that the discipline will be effective on your husband so that your husband will not go to hell. You will not at all be minimizing the discipline, saying, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, those people, that's how they do. Uh, who doesn't have any fault? Who doesn't have any sin? If you do that, you're encouraging your husband to go to hell. And if you continue like that, you might be a major factor and contributor to your husband going to hell. Not only that, as we come to the church, the discipline in the Bible is not only on quote and unquote workers. That is, somebody happens to be a Zona leader, happens to be a woman representative, happens to be a house fellowship leader, and does something wrong. 
Uh, if we love that individual, of course, if you're a worker and you do something wrong, I'm not saying something subjectively wrong, but something scripturally wrong. Uh, there's, there are a lot of things that are subjectively wrong. That, you know, as a leader, your feeling, you don't like what an individual has done, but it's not a sin in the Bible. You cannot quote chapter such and such, verse such and such, why this thing is a sin. So, that depends so much on how you feel. Uh, you don't want this, you don't want this, you don't want that. We cannot discipline people on how we feel. A person talks differently, a person acts differently, but he has not committed sin. Uh, we have to be so humble and go back to God and say, God, I don't want my personality to get involved in church administration. My personality is one thing, what I want, what I love, what I appreciate is one thing, but the scripture is another thing. But when somebody has committed sin, which means not sin, subjective, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you like things to be done. Somebody has committed real sin that we've read of in the Bible, maybe in Galatians or in Romans or in any other part of the Bible. And you know that this is sin. It takes a lot of courage. And it is one of the marks of the calling of a leader to be able to say, this is the Bible, and friend, you've gone wrong. Now this person that has gone wrong might be, quote and unquote, influential. But you see, you understand that you love him. And his influence is not going to cancel the fact that sin is sin. Because of that, you tell him, in love. In love because if you are being a carpenter, there are times you want to use the hammer to strike the nail and drive the nail into the wood and make the table or whatever you are making to be solid. There are times, instead of driving the nail to the real point, you really use the hammer on your hand. In discipline, that can happen. That instead of driving the nail to the right point, to make sure that this person's life becomes stable, you are actually injuring yourself. And you discipline a person in such a way that you yourself, you lose the sensitivity, you lose the love of God, you lose the grace of God, and it is like a personal thing. Uh, you cannot correct disorder in a disorderly manner. You cannot rebuke evil in an evil manner. And you cannot say that you want a person to get away from Satan as sin, and while you are doing that, your method links you most to Satan and sin yourself. And so discipline is a necessary thing, but a very delicate thing too. That when you found somebody in a fault, in your heart, there is a spirit of meekness and sobriety. You hate evil. You are going to deal with evil, but while dealing with evil. You don't do it in an evil manner. Obviously, Moses was justified. To know that these Israelites were rebels, always murmuring, always complaining, no endurance at all. Moses was, he knew that these people were rebels. But then, he was told by the Lord as to what to go and do. And he felt that at the same time, these people needed something more than water. And he gave them something more than water. And he got something more than he himself bargained for. And so as a leader, your own life and your own security and your own possibility of getting to heaven and your own possibility of remaining with the Lord, your own possibility of having the grace of God channeled into your life even depends upon your attitude. You discipline a person. And after disciplining the person, the way you talk to other people, the way you relate with other people, it's like you are happy that person was caught in that mess. Which means you are happy that Satan has been lifted up. You are happy that sin has been committed. You are happy that a person has gone away from the Lord. You are happy that the blood of Jesus Christ became ineffectual in that person's life. And 
God knows our temper. He knows our attitude. He knows the outward discipline. He knows the motive behind the discipline too. If the motive behind the discipline is just to uphold a righteous standard of God, God understands. If it is to help this individual to discover himself so that he will not continue to go astray, the Lord understands. If it is to, now this is my chance. I've been looking for an opportunity to catch this um, uh, zona leader and this area leader or this house fellowship leader. Now he cannot come out of this. This is my chance. Although you can quote all the scriptures about Eli, about correcting the children, about correcting members of the church, about them that sin, rebuke openly and sharply that others may fear, the quotation will be correct. But God knows the motive behind the quotation. That's why leadership is not a, just a simple thing. That, well, somebody has sinned, what do I do? The way you do the discipline, the way you do the questioning, the way you do the interview itself, I see for already, you have caught this person, you don't want him to get out of this, you are not even when you know that this person can be excused, that this thing is not really what it is, you are trying to use your common sense and reasoning to rope the man into the thing and to ask this question and this question and that question to make sure that he doesn't come out, he's guilty by all means. I mean, God understands. Although the people may not understand, but God understands. And when God sees all that, God sees that you are not defending his glory. You are not upholding holiness. You are not helping the church. It is not because of the lesson on Eli. That's not your real motive and uh, reason. Your reason is that you have been uh, looking for an opportunity to exercise power. And there has not been any opportunity to exercise power. And this is an opportunity, and I dare not let this opportunity go so that they will know there is a leader here who exercises power. Remember, there is a greater power over you. And that greater power, he understands all things. So, let's obey the Bible. And as we do in disciplining people, we do it for fear and trembling. We have to do it. If we don't do it, we are judged. If we do it wrongly, we are just. See the uh, difficulty upon a leader. If you see sin and you don't talk, you can miss heaven. If you see sin and you talk, but you talk in the wrong way, you can miss heaven. Don't talk, problem. You talk, problem. Who is sufficient for these things? That's why it's more difficult for a leader to get to heaven than for the ordinary member. The ordinary members wake up and read their Bibles they don't steal, they don't commit adultery, they don't do this and that. They say, oh God, keep me until the final day. Jesus comes and they go. But the leader, you know, thousands of people that go to the land of Canaan, all they did was just to eat the manna, drink the water, and did everything that they were supposed to do. And they go to the land of Canaan. But Moses, the biggest of them all, the highest of them all, it's difficult for a leader to get to heaven. And we better realize that, that everything you do, rebuking people, correcting people, we do it with fear. And also you don't excuse anything in your own life. You realize that what you are rebuking other people for, you are guilty of. You don't cover your own and expose the other man. Because if you do that, it will mean that because of your position, you have a way of covering up your own. Of saying that things are all right. And you always have the excuse to give. If the children of other people, if they misbehave, you know the scriptures to quote. If your own children misbehave, you don't know those scriptures. There's another scripture that you will quote, and the people, you just silence them. I mean, there are some people that know enough scriptures to silence you when it comes to their own fault. If the wives of other people are not dressing right, and they know how they know their appropriate verses. And they know the time you ought to discipline them. And the way you ought to discipline them. And those women, they have to be submissive in this district. Because if you are not submissive, you are touching the anointed of the Lord. You are not cooperating. You are destroying the work of God. And you know, we know how to talk when other people's wives go astray. When our wives go astray. And they do exactly the same thing. That those other people's wives, then... 
we, you know, will come to the people and say, you people that are pointing at you, same thing that the Bible says, judge not, and that ye may not be judged, because it's your wife. It's going to be difficult for leaders to get to heaven. Because of that partiality, and because of a kind of life that is not actually straightforward, that we're not standing totally on the Bible, the Word of God. It's wonderful to be a leader. It's great, great privilege. And there are people outside there in the district, they're struggling. They're struggling. They say, I want to become zonal leader. I want to become coordinator. I want to become missionary. I want to become state overseer. I want to become region uh, overseer. They're struggling for the post. They don't know that when you get into it, your percentage, probability of getting to heaven becomes less. And those of you who are inside, don't tell them over there that the greatest thing you can be in the church is to be a leader. Well, sometimes it's great to be a leader. But sometimes it's not so great to be a leader. And if you're a leader, and you cannot avoid being a leader, some people should pray and say, God, maybe I'm not ready yet to be a leader. Because this is delicate. But if you're a leader already, and there's no way you can avoid being a leader, you need to pray more. You have got saved before, you pray again that that salvation will stay. You have got sanctified before. You know, a lot of things that happen to, you know, the church and the district and everything can, can so annoy that leader. And in his defense of the gospel, defense of righteousness, and in his trying to also not get into the pitfall of Eli, he gets into the pitfall of Moses. Think about it. You run from the pit in this direction so that I don't look like Eli. Then while you are running away from falling into the pit that Eli fell into, you fell into the pit that Moses fell into. I pray God will help you. Let's rise up and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lesson we have learned today. We've seen the delicate position that a leader finds himself. He must love. And yet he must not love to the point that he overlooks sin. He must be strict. And yet he must not be strict to the point that everything comes out harsh, destructive. He must uphold holiness, but he must first of all uphold it in his own life, in his family, in his wife, in his own children. He must help in the work of God, and yet the greatest work of God is to be done in his own soul. He must preach. And yet, O oh Lord, the most convicting message he to preach is to be preached unto himself. He must pray. And yet, a part of prayer that is so necessary is prayer for his own soul not to dry up in the wilderness. He must counsel. And yet, counseling begins by him counseling himself, showing himself, his own frailties and weaknesses and inconsistencies. And only after having counseled himself in the word of God, can he then arise to counsel other people. He has the children of other people to train, instruct, and teach. And yet, he must make sure that he finds time to train, to teach, to instruct his own children. He must correct the women in the church that maybe they don't dress well. Maybe they don't talk right. Maybe they are not zealous in the work of God. Maybe they are lukewarm. And yet the first correction must come upon his own wife. Father, who is sufficient for peace? We know that the mighty are falling. And the people that appear to have been great leaders, they are falling 
They have gone astray in some little, little things. And we know that you are no respecter of persons. Lord, we bring ourselves before you. That as we learn lessons like this, on your rebuke, your correction, your wrath, your peers' judgment upon Eli, because of the sin of immorality, fornication, evil, that his sons, his two sons, who are called priests, that they committed with the women right at the gate, at the door of the sanctuary. He knew it. He rebuked them. But the rebuke was so mild that it's like there was no rebuke at all. It appeared that the other children of Israel could not do anything about it. It appeared that those two sons were untouchable. And their father still remained the high priest at the figurehead. But he said to him, and he told him you are going to bring judgment. And that even your covenant with his house, that that covenant you are going to terminate right there. That those three children were going to die. That even the priesthood will not continue in their family. And we remember as we read further how those two sons died. And how Eli died. O Lord, as we come before your word, we can only thank you that Jesus had not come. Because there are those of us here who are weak in disciplining people. There are those of us here who are still sin. There are those of us here who are so soft that in our districts anything goes. On the other hand, there are those of us here that in our districts there is so much harshness, hot temper. And we're so hard that even some people run away from that district. That we're no more feeling the shield, feeling the line. And the way we talk openly to the women, to the young people, brings the people to fear us more than they fear God. We know that if Jesus comes, such people that are living in bitterness, anger, hot temper, and will spend all the time, instead of feeding the people, spend all the time scourging them. We don't know if there's any hope for such people who scatter the sheep, who destroy the people of God, who bring them under the bondage of fear. We don't know whether there's any hope for them to get to the promised land. Because words of anger become serious when it comes out of the mouth of the leader. The miracles may still be happening. The water may be coming out of the rock. But the man that God uses to bring the water out of the rock himself may not get to the land of Canaan where those people who drank the water will get to. I would pray that you help us to serve the Lord with fear and trembling. That as we try to defend the gospel, Honestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, that will not do it in a wrong way. That, Lord, we ourselves be so meek, sober, humble, looking up to you and to you alone, praying always, that after preaching to others, we ourselves will not become a castaway. Help us to follow you, and to lead in your church with all gentleness, with all humility, yet without 
partiality. Lord, we know that being a leader is not easy. We need more prayer. We need more of your word. Oh Lord, we remember some of the people in our own church in Lagos here or maybe outside Lagos who are so much in a hurry to become a leader on their own. And they've gone to establish one ministry or the other. And they miss the opportunity of hearing what we hear. And this past Congress that they could have participated in, they missed. Oh Lord, we look up to you that if we who are hearing every week, we still see that it's going to take grace to enter. How about these people that have gone and they don't hear anything and are just lords of their own kingdom, emperor of their own empire? No correction, what they like, they do. Like Nebuchadnezzar, whoever they want, they put down. Whoever they want, they exalt. Nobody to ask them, why do you do that? Or what doest thou? Oh Lord, if those of us who just came out of the Leadership Strategy Congress, if we still see the necessity to pray, knowing that it's going to take real, real grace to make it. How much more these other people? We pray, O oh Lord, that you show more of your love to their souls. Make them to see that being a leader is a very, very delicate thing. That they be careful what they say, careful what they teach, Careful how they relate with their people. Careful what they do. Father, for those of us who are here, and we are hearing all these things, and we cannot say we did not know, we cannot say we did not hear, help us, Lord. Grant us more of your grace to be balanced. That while we run away from the pitfall of Eli, we don't harshly, recklessly run into the pitfall of Moses. That we should not be so soft, we cannot rebuke anyone. Yet we should not be so harsh and harsh, callous and insensitive that we rebuke in a way that we even lose our own souls. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. The word of God to you tonight. And this being our first Wednesday in our leadership meeting at the headquarters church here, I think it will be good that we patiently listen to the word of God. I'm talking to you tonight on keeping spiritually fresh. Keeping spiritually fresh. In Psalm 1. Reading from verse 3. And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here, the righteous person is likened to a tree that is planted by rivers of water. And it says that its leaves will be fresh, will not wither. He will bring forth its fruit in his season. And whatever he does, the Bible says there, he will prosper. In Psalm 92, from verse 12, The righteous shall flourish, like the palm tree, it shall grow like cedar in, ba in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They will bring forth fruit in old age. 
they shall be fat and flourishing. Here you see in symbolic form, in pictorial language, the life of the righteous and the spiritual freshness that is expected in the righteous person. We have just uh, finished the Leadership Strategy Congress and no doubt many spiritual blessings have been received and it is very necessary that these blessings of God be preserved in our lives. Not only that the blessings are preserved, that the blessings are transmitted to the church. That's the reason for the Leadership Strategy Congress that we ourselves will become spiritually fresh and then we'll be able to help the church to come to spiritual freshness. There should be a way of transferring and transmitting the spiritual impact of the Congress to the various congregations that we represent. If that is going to be the case, there must be firm firmness in following the law and a firm decision that everything that God did in your heart or God did in your life during that Congress will remain. Many times it's easy for people to get to the mountaintop within a single week and then the following week or weeks, just in a few weeks, they can be back in the valley again. That is a pity with human nature. And if that is not going to happen to us, there has to be some firm decision that what God has done, we do not want to lose. Not only that there will be a firm decision, there will be continual praying that we will need to pray and count all those spiritual blessings one by one. All the things that God convicted us about and then what we need to correct them, count them one by one. And then write them down, if possible. And the consecrations to make, and the decisions to make, write everything down. And even try to put down the spiritual atmosphere in which you found yourself. The seriousness of what God actually did at such a time. And then continually pray about it. And at the life, we live together in the Congress that made all those things to be possible, that you will now live that life continually. The life we live as we are together, the unity of the Spirit, the continual prayer, the fact that your dressing is according to the Word of God, the fact that you will not abstain, you will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, the fact that when you are sick, you will trust the Lord, call upon the elders of the church. The fact that all the word of God is pure, and you are not going to take away, you are not going to add to the word of God. The way you prayed earnestly, you walked carefully, you related with other people with the consciousness that you are a leader and you represent the gospel of the Lord. That carefulness. And that prayerfulness and that lifestyle should continue. That's the way we can keep the spiritual freshness in our lives. Then it says in Psalm 1 where we read, it talks of it shall be like a tree that is planted. You make sure that you are planted by the rivers of living water. The word of God is compared to water. And it is this word of God you need to plant yourself in. And do not just be in a hurry to preach. Rather, plant yourself into the Word of God. Both Old Testament and the New Testament. Read and study. Examine yourself. Examine your life. And plant yourself by the rivers of living water. Not only that, you are going to have to readjust, reorganize your time. If this new year is going to be different for you, you are going to have to reorganize your time. If this new year is going to be different for your family, you are going to have to reorganize your time. 
You remember the message on marriage, if you are the Congress. And you saw that the husband ought to create time. Time for discussion. Time to solve problems. Times to listen to the wife. Times to look at the children. Times for devotion with the family. Times when husband, wife, and children can get together every day, not once a week, every day, to be able to get into the Word of God. And those are not times we hold you over. Those are not times we say, I don't really have the time, but the church says this should be done. No, the Bible says it should be done. You are the priest in your own home. And as the leader in that home, you have to create the time. If you don't, you may discover that all that you learn during the time of the Congress, everything is gone. So, create time. There will be time you sit down without being in a hurry, discuss with your wife. Know her heart aches. Know her problems. Know her prayer requests. And take time to pray together. Don't just run ahead and get nearer heaven and leave your wife far behind. And don't allow your wife to remain in the midst of the enemies that she is not able to handle all alone by herself. If you are wise, I'm sure that if your in-laws are around, especially the parents of the man, and you know that every time they come, your wife uh, always gets afraid, fearful because of the things that may be happening. I don't think that's the best time for you to be, you know, so busy outside. You are not around. You don't know the fire they are putting on your wife. And every spiritual thing your wife got, she might lose while you are not around and the in-laws are around. You should make up your mind if you don't have any other convert and you don't take any other person to heaven, you'll take your wife to heaven. At least Noah did that. His wife, his own sons, and the sons of his own and the wives of his sons. So if you don't have other people that you are taking to heaven, at least make sure that your wife goes with you. Because it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and what? And thy house. But are your children saved? Is your wife able to cope spiritually? Do you even care that your wife has need, spiritual need, that you need to address? So then, create time. If when you, you since you came from the Congress last Saturday, until this Wednesday, you didn't readjust your timetable to create time for your wife and children, already about four or five days have been lost. You've lost them. And those days are not going to come back. And it is tonight. You have to redress that issue. You have to go back tonight and say, now this is what you do. And what I told you at the Congress, I said after that message on marriage, the family foundations, the foundation for a strong church. I said after that message, you should search for your wife, and the wife should search for the husband, and sit down, talk together, where the problems are big, and where we've not been able to actually carry, take one another along. And where we've been just enduring the marriage, tolerating the marriage. But then it's not how things ought to be. I said it that time. Now that, that's last week, Friday. Saturday is gone. Sunday is gone. Monday is gone. Tuesday is gone. Wednesday is going. If you've not done that, you're losing something. You are hearing, but you are not doing it. And so if we're not careful, we're going to remain spiritually dry. In the midst of all those wonderful things we have done create time and make sure that this time that you create you are going to keep to it that business or your market or the district or the church or other responsibilities are not going to conflict with that if you have time to eat you must have time for your wife you have time to sleep you must have time for your wife and the time I mean is not when you are not yourself the morning when you are yourself, when everything is fresh, 
when you can pay attention and you can listen very well and you are very sharp and you are very complete, that's when to do it. Not when you know that really, you know, everything is gone. Your energy, life, all you want to do is just pass, eat and sleep. That's not the time to say, well, I will create time. Now, since uh, the Bible is talking about this, you know, uh, my wife, when are we really going to have time? Well, I think if, as you look at my uh, timetable and my life, I think that uh, to make sure that we keep this time and we don't miss it, I think, you know, to be sincere, the time we have is 11.30 every day at night. We are not serious yet. All those things you are putting as very compulsory and very important to push the time with your wife till 11.30. Are they more important than your wife's spiritual life? Are your children's spiritual life? You must first bring these children to the world and we never even know how the children are behaving. We don't know what the children are doing. Create time for the family. Then I've spoken about family devotion. Christian training for the children. That you will teach your children the Bible. Teach them the word of God. And teach them how to live. And practice it with them. And then prompt obedience to the word of God. As uh, we read the word of God every day, we need to promptly obey the Lord. Sensitivity to the spirit of God. This is what keeps us fresh. The spirit of God says something. And you don't just gloss over it and forget all about it. You make sure you are very sensitive. That's the voice of my Father speaking to me. That's the word of Christ, my shepherd, directing me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. That's the Spirit telling me that is what you do according to the Scripture. Be very, very sensitive. Well, maybe in the day the Lord will rebuke you for staying in a particular place with a group of people. And the Lord says... Now, you are a child of God, you are a minister of the gospel. Is, should you be standing with that crowd? Oh Lord, I'm sorry. And you don't continue a second in that place. That's being sensitive. You are discussing and uh, you are saying while you are planning, I'm going to spend days on my mother and days on my daddy and days on my junior sister and days and all that. And you put everything down and the Spirit of God says, how selfish you are. I about the relatives of your wife, nothing for them. All the money is to be spent on you. Immediately, oh Lord, I'm sorry. That's the old thing. The old man trying to come back into my life. Because those are the things that nailed to the cross that others forced. The relatives of my wife forced. The relatives of the other people of the other person forced. Not the way we've been doing it before 1993. That every time we're thinking about planning how to spend, I'm always thinking about my own daddy, my own mommy, my own sisters, my own brothers, my own, my own, my own. Every time that the woman is like marginalized. It's like she doesn't have relatives to think about. So, sensitivity to the spirit of God. Please, turn the cassette. That you are doing something that is the old way. Almost forgetting yourself. That you are going the old way again. You say, Lord, I'm sorry for that. And you correct it immediately. Consciousness of Christ's second coming. You see, if we're going to really keep spiritually fresh, you wake up in the morning in a new day and say, the Lord may come today. And because the Lord may come today, it affects how you speak. It affects where you go. It affects whatever you get involved in. It affects everything that you plan. Because you say, what if the Lord will come now? And you know that uh, we who are uh, leaders, we counsel a lot. And uh, some of us who counsel, we are not as spiritually sensitive as we ought to be. Uh, you know, if you are enjoy the particular food when you are very very young and you anytime you smell that food if you just said about two hours ago you become hungry again because of the special way the smell the odor of that kind of food has on you and you know that this food is not available for you 
and you see that uh, over there they, they are cooking that kind of food and at a very long distance you can smell the odor and you will know that that food is in that direction and you know there's no way of getting in there to uh, go and eat the food so if you allow the odor to persist and you stay there you are going to be torturing yourself you are going to be tempting yourself because you cannot eat it and your body is already responding to the odor you understand what i mean so what do you do you run away from that place so that as the odor uh, tries to linger and you go away from that environment then you don't have that smell again and then you're all right now let me tell you what i mean by that kind of illustration and parable you see man even after you are born again thank god you are born again it's your soul that is redeemed this body is not redeemed yet and the bible says that the whole creation is crying so that the whole creation can be redeemed now although you are saved your soul doesn't like to sin your soul doesn't like any evil thing but the body has not been redeemed that's why when it is cold a believer feels cold and a sinner feels cold that's why if it is hot a believer says i need the fan an unbeliever says i need the fan that's why if there's an accident and the bones of the believer is broken as a shouting pain pain the unbeliever too is shouting pain pain why because it's the same body the body of the believer is not redeemed it's not saved it is the soul that is saved would you know that the coordinator's body is not saved that the body is not redeemed yet that it is the soul that is saved that's why you see in my own counseling room you see how we construct the place there's a place where people sit and then there is a glass door and everything is glass so that whoever sits inside there he knows that there are people out there he knows that people sitting in that place are looking at her or him and uh, the person there also knows that he can see all the people there that's why there is no privacy now why do we do that oh because i know it is my soul that is saved it is not my body that is saved and if you don't do like your pastor does and you close the door because you are a superior counselor and you are counseling these ladies and there's no glass window there is nothing all that you do there nobody sees what you do you may discover that you have gone to hell before you shout for hell because temptation will come and the devil likes to target leaders because you are doing damage to his kingdom so he likes to target you and if you are you know the kind of big-headed leader that you don't understand why we do what we do at the central church the headquarters church and you think that well why do they leave the glass there why is this the pastor has no privacy it is to make it easier for the pastor to get to heaven you know even the unbelievers when you are out in the street even if they are feeling temptation uh, most unbelievers are however bad they are they cannot do the evil thing outside they have to be talking to the lady let's go somewhere let's go somewhere let's go somewhere and if there's no place to go then the sin is not committed you wonder why i never go anywhere alone never go out of this country alone I never sleep anywhere alone if my wife is not there my driver is there and if they give me a particular place and they want to give my driver a separate room and say leave, leave him he's uh, you know my brother let him stay in you know in the city room there and i take this room and anybody that is going to come in they get at him first before they get at me because i want to get to heaven but some people don't think of wanting to get to heaven be very careful this is a new year and in this new year how we ought to be very careful and god will help you you see if you are sensitive to the spirit of god and you know that what god has done in your life you are conscious that christ may come today suddenly he will appear 
without any moment's warning. If you are careful like that, I'm sure, sure the rapture happen anytime. What a wonderful thing it will be that all of us as we are here like this, maybe you are in your district, maybe you are even counseling when the trumpet sounded, or maybe you are in the market or, you know, somewhere, by the grace of God, will meet up there in Jesus' name. But be very conscious that Christ can come at any time. Then, have an example, live an exemplary life. Everything you do, you say, if a new convert sees me, how will it help the new convert? How will it help that individual to know how to live righteously? If we don't do these things, the danger we have is in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 4. Hosea chapter 6 and in verse 4. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goes away. Here God lamented through the prophet over these uh, children of Israel, Ephraim and Judah. So what else will I do? Because when you have this goodness upon you now, it's like the morning dew. Within a short time, everything is dried up again. Everything goes away. And this is the problem God has with his church. That we have a December retreat, and a lot of the people, they come to the mountaintop, they are prayed, and wonderful things have happened. Then, in a short time, like the morning dew, everything has passed away. And the same thing, we go to the Congress, God has really brought us to a mount of transfiguration. And before a long time again, it's like the dew of the morning, everything has passed away. I pray it will not be so in Jesus' name. There's also the danger of being a stumbling block. We don't have time to read all of the scriptures, but in Luke chapter 10 verse 40, here Martha came to the Lord Jesus Christ and was pleading with Jesus Christ that Jesus will force Mary to come and get involved like she has gotten involved. And yet, Mary was listening to the word of God. There are some of us leaders that will literally act like Martha. We ourselves, you are already used to activity. If you are not active, you think you are backsliding. If you are not jumping and running and going, doing this and doing that, you think you are backsliding. You measure your own spiritual kind of life with activity. But uh, if you understand... Uh, the way the scripture goes, you shouldn't be doing that. You should give yourself continually to the word of God and to pray. But because you give yourself to activity, too much activity, you have the same thing on the membership in the church. You want them to, to be running and to be active, to be going here, to be going there. You tell them to save souls when their own souls are not fully saved. If we are wise, why do we have two half saved people? Half saved. Not fully saved. Many of those people don't have real assurance. Half saved, half dead. Why don't we become wise and concentrate on this individual that we see now and make sure that this person is soundly saved and his spiritual life is very, very deep. It's like if a doctor will have patients in his hospital and these patients in the hospital, they have not all really got well, still sick, still staggering, still weak, still not able to eat very well and they still need much attention. But the doctor says there are a lot of patients outside. Therefore, you patients that at least you are not now very near the brink of the grave, you are almost alive now, you, maybe you can make it, but because of all these other patients, rise up, take that bucket, go and take that water, go and do this, go and do that, because of those patients outside, these patients that are almost getting well, they will become sick again, they will not even be able to take care of those patients outside. If we are not careful, the ones inside, the ones outside will die without living. 
And the same thing with the people in our districts. We, we make people to want to labor too much. And I want to tell you something. I said it in a way at the Congress, but uh, maybe people did not get it. You know, a person can do much, much work after being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Much. And if you bring all that a person tries to do in 10 years, you bring it together without being baptized in the Holy Ghost, if a person is really baptized in the Holy Ghost within about six months, he can do what an unbaptized person is trying to do for 10 years. Therefore, what's the best way to do it? Get the people, like Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. Oh, he knew that they were perishing. He knew that there were many sinners in Jerusalem. He knew that there were many sinners in Samaria, many sinners in Judea. But he said, wait, don't go and preach. Wait in Jerusalem. What are we going to be waiting for? Until you, you are endued with power from on high. Because if you are not endued with power from on high, you are running and running and running. You are not going to do much. You are not going to be able to endure the persecution. You are not going to be able to have the wisdom. You are not going to be able to have the insight into the scripture. You are not going to be able to have spiritual energy, anointing, power, unction to get it done. So, what's the most economical way to do it and the most effective way to do it? Don't be too active. Come back home and stay in that upper room until ye be endured with power from on high. And look at our districts. There are those half saved people. And we tell them, become a worker, become this, become this, become this. They even need assurance themselves. Not only that, those people who are saved and they know that they are not sanctified and the Bible says without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Instead of telling them, impressing it upon them, what you need now is not running up and down, go to the closet. You need consecration, you need praying, you need digging deep into the, into the fountain of the grace of God so you can be sanctified and so that when Jesus comes, you'll be able to go because you already you have purified yourself. And even those who have got sanctified, we tell them that there's a limit to what you can do. You may try to climb up the mountain. You may try to go to this area and go to that area. You may try to labor. You may try to run up and down. You may try to visit. There is a limit to what you can do until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And emphasize it to them. Because it is when they are baptized, actually you will find that they will be able to do real work. And you know, those of us who are leaders, a lot of things we cannot do without the Holy Ghost. A lot we can do, though, without the Holy Ghost. I mean, a person can stand up and read some verses. Even some people who are nominal Christians who are not born again, they do that. And they repeat the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And when somebody dies, they know the funeral passage to read. And when a child is born, they know where to read. And when they are going to dedicate a church building, they know where to read. They know where the temple of Solomon was dedicated, so they are able to read that. Without being saved, there are a lot of things you can read. A lot of these white garment people, without being saved, they know Psalm 1, they know Psalm 23, they know Psalm 51, they know some of these Psalms. A lot of things you can do without even being saved, but they don't matter to God. Also, after you are saved, a lot of activities, things you can do. And I say, I'm working for God. I'm doing my best for God. A lot of things you can do, but... They don't bear much fruit. You, you can witness for days. They don't bear much fruit. Because witnessing without prayer, without intercession, without being filled with the Holy Ghost, without being revealed again with the Holy Ghost, witnessing that is just energy, activity, speaking, you won't do much. Even those of us who are leaders. Uh, you know, they, I wonder why people don't uh, you know, see my example. When I want to prepare for a, a program like the Leadership Strategy Congress, I don't make myself available the way I used to make myself available. I get into the Word of God and I get into praying. And that's why I don't repeat the message I preached before. Just take out the outline. I have the outline. I could have taken them out and just preached the same thing. I will need to be fresh from the altar of God. But you see, people like to see me and they want, they want me to be there all the time. And since we came back from the Congress, people have, you know, wanted to see me. They just want to see me. They don't care whether you don't have time to read the Bible. They assume that you already have, a, have the whole Bible. They assume that you already have everything that you want. But I take time. 
because I know that the bread on the show table for yesterday is not going to be appropriate on the table of the Lord today. You need the fresh bread to bring there again. You read that in the Old Testament. And therefore, every time, you take time. You take time. You don't just say, well, I did it this way before. This is the way I'm going to do it now. Because if you do it like that, you're not going to really be serving the Lord. Therefore, we should be very careful that we don't just labor and labor and labor with a lot of activities. And then the danger is that it will be a stumbling block to other people. They will copy you. They are going to say that what you appreciate and what you demonstrate is being busy, busy, busy. And everything is going to leak out until we just become sounding brass, but there is no power of God. I believe that this year things will be different. In your districts, uh, I don't know how you can make it. Uh, there's Bible study on Monday. There's something on Tuesday. There's something on Wednesday here. There's something on uh, Thursday. There's something also you are fixed up on, on Saturday. There's something on, uh, on Friday, on Saturday. And of course Sunday. It's throughout. You get there in the morning. And you barely can even eat. And then after that, you go to the marriage uh, counseling and we mislead a lot of people because there's no freshness of the Spirit of God. We open our mouth like this and it's a dry old cheek that is talking because there's nothing fresh. And what we told Brother A is what we tell Brother B is what we're going to tell Brother C. Nothing new, nothing fresh, nothing that is applicable to this particular person because of his peculiar problem. And everything is just like that, and it doesn't have the anointing of God upon it. And then we continue like that until 6 o'clock, and your wife will barely beg you, uh, my husband, please eat, please eat. You say, okay, and uh, bring the food, and you eat. As you are eating like this, immediately you finish, you go for visitation. And before you come back, children are slept, wife are slept, and then 11 o'clock, there you are. And you say, you are working for God. I'm not sure. Because you see all that work, it's not bearing fruit. And that's what the Zona leaders still try to do. That's what the area leaders try to do. And that's what the house fellowship leaders eventually are going to be doing. And that's, that's another thing. That's why some people that have the call of God to work for God in the church, that's why they are afraid. Because they count it. They say, if I become a worker, it means no time to wash my baby's clothes. No time to go to the market on Saturday because the coordinator always has this special announcement. Saturday, 10 o'clock, all the workers must come because we're going to do water baptism. And they're not going to do the water baptism, but he wants them to be there. And when we finish that water baptism, nobody must be late. The workers' meeting is going to start at 4 o'clock and so and so, so and so. I hope you get here at 3 o'clock and you start praying. When are they going to eat? Are they going to take care of their families? That's why some people are afraid to say, let me be coming to church. I don't want to be a worker. Because so and so, he was better spiritually. Before he became a worker, after he became a worker, his spiritual life went down. We become stumbling blocks to the people. This year, we are going to readjust our time in Jesus' name. We are going to see that there is enough time. Enough time to pray. Enough time to rest. Enough time to relax. Enough time with your family, enough time with the Bible in a personal way. Then enough time to work for God. It is not the length of time you spend on the work. It is how baptized and filled and energized by the Holy Ghost you are. If you have the Holy Ghost upon you, you don't need, you know, to be busy every day and every hour of the day. Let's make sure that we we'll see what to do. Well, to round up, preservation of the new refreshing spiritual life. What do we do to preserve? I give you the points and the references because of time. Number one, pray more than others. Pray more than others. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Jesus prayed more than his disciples. And a coordinator must pray more than the others. Not just public praying, private praying. Number two, give priority to the world. Give priority to the world. Above activity, give priority to the world. If somebody has a difficulty and says, I don't have enough time, 
which one should I choose? To come to the Monday Bible study or to come to the uh, special meeting that coordinator is calling during the week? The priority is the Monday Bible study. Give priority to the world above activity. Acts chapter 6 verse 4. Number three, take regular spiritual inventory. Which means, check up on the floor. Check up on the spiritual line. of the people check up how many of them are really saved how many of them are going on with the lord check up on your own life too check up on your own family too take regular spiritual inventory that's in proverbs chapter 27 verse 23 number four lead gently and softly don't drive aggressively lead gently and softly. You see that a nursing mother came late to the meeting without even asking her, try to understand. Lead softly and gently. You see that a pregnant woman is not able to do everything, even when we have cut down the activities and we have tried to minimize the activities. The, not, the pregnant woman is not able to even still do that minimum. Understand, understand. Lead softly and gently. You see that some students are not able to come into all these uh, meetings because they have to prepare for uh, the, the test, the coursework that they are doing at school. And uh, you see that they cannot come to all these meetings on Saturday and come to this one and come to that one. Understand, these are children. Lead softly and gently. And then, of course, uh, now uh, women listen to this. When you have your once a month women's meeting, I would appreciate it and I would thank you for it if you excuse the secondary school children. Many times in your women's meeting, you will uh, be discussing about marriage and about this and about this. And all these uh, 14, 15, 16 year old uh, young girls in maybe... Uh, mm last few years in the secondary school they don't need all that now and if you are talking about marriage knowing the will of god and these children are there and you're talking often like that you make these children to be thinking about something they shouldn't be thinking about at present and then you are taking them away from their studies therefore let them keep with their studies all these extra extra things what if we call this wednesday meeting at a time where you should be in your office You'll not be able to make it. The same thing with those children. They have assignment. They have homework. And they have to. And in the school of today, the school system, the course work is very important. It is not just when you are at school, the final exam you took at the end of the year or at the end of, you know, your whole secondary school. What these children are doing from week to week is very important in evaluating them in their exam. And therefore, please, let them have time to study. Otherwise, they're going to backslide eventually. They're going to say, I trusted the Lord, I gave all my time to God, but look at it now, I failed my exam. It's not God that made them to fail, it's the coordinator and the women leaders that made them to fail. Let's be very careful. And let's make sure that these young people have the time they ought to have. Even those who are at the university, they have a lot to do. And if uh, the university students happen to be in your district, don't make it compulsory. If they are able to come to Monday Bible study, in fact, if they are not able to come, we don't put any pressure on those students. For Thursday, we don't put any pressure on them. Or the only thing we require from them, because you see, they have other fellowships on campus. And the children, too, the young people have other fellowships. The only thing we require from them is to come to the Sunday worship. And of course, they are workers already on the campus. Therefore, to make them work us again in the district, we're going to over-labor them so much that they'll not have any time to read, any time to study. And to get them involved in this marriage something and this other one, we want to leave all these university students alone and not to think about marriage now, let them just think about their lives. So let us make sure that we lead gently and don't uh, make statements that uh, will be very, very condemning, saying, if you were not here last Saturday, when I called a meeting here, and you didn't come, 
raise up your hand. And then they raise up their hand. All those people, the Bible says, that is rebellion. I'm not sure. And the Bible says you are not submissive. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If a person is dying in his house or in her house, and you called for a particular meeting, and then he couldn't make it because of his health, that's not rebellion. God is a good God, a loving God. We are not to drive the people aggressively. After all, it's not our work, it's the work of God. We appeal to them, we love them, we encourage them. There should be encouraging words with us. But every time we are hammering submission to, leader, submission to leadership, we are giving them a wrong impression. And we are condemning people that God has not condemned. This new year, can we be like real gentle mothers and loving fathers? Oh yes, we'll still rebuke people when they should be rebuked. But not just anyhow. Lead gently and lead softly. Don't drive aggressively. That's in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11. Isaiah 40 verse 11. Number five, emphasize. Emphasize holiness and lessen the activities. Because what takes them to heaven is not the activities, it's holiness. Hebrews 12, 14. And the holiness we're emphasizing, this is very, very important. You need to pay attention. It's not the holiness of the Pharisees that make the outside of the cup clean, but inwardly they have a dead man's bones in them. It is not the holiness that, you know, you kneel down, you prostrate, you bend, you do this, you do that. It's an internal work of grace that is done. Then it comes out in a very beautiful way. You know that this fellow is a child of God because of the work of grace within. Number six, center on Holy Spirit's power in service. Center on Holy Spirit's power in service. Let the people know. That activities that is not done in the anointing, in the unction, in the power of the Holy Spirit is sometimes useless. In fact, sometimes it has a negative effect rather than a positive effect on the work. Number seven, stop judging success in the district by the outward size of the district church. Stop judging the success of the district work by the outward size of the local district church. The other one, number six, is Acts chapter one, verses four to eight. This one is Luke chapter fourteen, verse twenty-four to verse twenty-eight. Jesus said, "Many will come, and he will say, you preached in our streets. We attended the fellowship.'" We even ate with you. Which means that you are at present when the preaching of the word was going on. And it would have been counted one, two, three, four, up to five hundred or six hundred or five thousand. But Jesus will tell them, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So don't just judge by the number of people that are there. Let's have a better yardstick. Let people really be coming to know the Lord. Number eight, always think of the final judgment day when your work or service will be judged by fire by God. Always think of the final judgment day when your works or service will be judged by fire by the Lord. That's in First Corinthians chapter 3 verses 9 to 17. That if on that day your works will be burnt by fire, there will be no reward. And think of all the people who were gathered together in the districts. Think of their numbers. And think of what they do. Have we given enough time to them? Can you say you are very sincere? And that the way you are being ministered to, and the way I emphasize by the grace of God is spiritual. Can you say you are faithful? in emphasizing the same spiritual thing. What's going to happen is that if you go back to the district 
and you throw all that I've said now, you throw it into the dustbin. You say, no, what I want is activity. The pastor is not here to see me or to correct me. And the people go on like that in those activities. If they get lost, their blood is going to be on you. And if in your leadership you are so hard and harsh, that because of you, not because of the doctrine, the people accept the salvation, the restitution, the holiness, the Holy Ghost baptism, the marriage, according to the word of God, they think that it's really inconveniencing them, that they're saying, well, if it's like that, I don't think I can be in this church. Driving them away. It's not the Bible. I mean, the Bible is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the word of God is beautiful. Jesus is so loving. Jesus will never hurt anyone. If Jesus were to come to this church and come to your district and do the work himself, many people that have run away will come back immediately. We are the people driving them, not the Bible. The Bible is sweet. It's a wonderful book. And when you read this book, it comforts, it cleanses, it washes, it corrects in a very wonderful way. You even like the correction. And when God lays the stick upon you, then he brings love. One hand it is stick, the other hand it is, since I rebuke Ephraim, I've been thinking upon him because how can I let Ephraim go? I'm married unto Israel. I have everlasting love unto Israel. He rebukes with one hand, then he's gentle and loving with the other hand. If it's God doing it himself, these people will not be running away. Maybe instead of gathering together with Christ, we have been scattering away from Christ. If we look at all these things we have talked about today, I believe things should change. That your life should change, your leadership style should change, and the way we present things should change. I pray that we will learn our lesson, and this new year will be a year of new refreshing. Let's rise up and we are reaching notes now. Are you going to have time to go over again when you go back home? Are you going to create time this year for your wife and children? Are you going to tell God to give you wisdom to balance up everything? Oh yes, the Lord will. He can do it. Will you ever change? Can you bring correction to the way you handle the world? Give the women some time to take care of their family? Will you give the young people time to study? Are you going to give the men some time? To be with their family, are you going to give those half-saved people time to have real assurance for their own salvation before too much involvement? Those involvements can dry up their little, feeble, spiritual life. You as a leader, are you keeping your body under control? Or are you under the pretext of counseling, messing up your life? Your wife doesn't know it, but God knows. 